the modern Prometheus. I'm going to start with three words and an image is going to pop into your head when I put these three words up on the screen. This is really interesting because I think that the image that I've got in my head is very similar to the image that you've got in your head. This is an extremely powerful and pervasive meme, an idea that has grabbed hold of us and it extends right around the world as well. There are a few things that we can say about this mad scientist. I think he's a he. Has anybody got a female mad scientist in their head? No. And there will be some characters, there'll be some visual characteristics of this scientist that I think um, we will all have in common. Um, and then something about his personality as well. So I thought about where he came from, this, this mad scientist in my head. I think there's an element of this. Uh, there's a bit of this. Doc Brown from Back to the Future. Um, and actually, my one's got a little bit of him as well. Professor Heinz Wolf thrown in for good measure. I thought about this and I thought, well, actually, I haven't actually met any of these people, but I'm pretty sure that they're fairly benign characters. I don't think they're malevolent at all. And yet, the mad scientist that I've got in my head is an evil character. He is possibly clutching a test tube of bubbling liquid, or he's standing next to a machine pulling levers on it, and there are sparks of electricity flying, and he's muttering to himself about some fiendish plan, or perhaps even cackling. So where has that come from? Where has this incredible evil mad scientist come from? The idea that this is what scientists do behind closed doors. They're hell-bent on possibly the destruction of humanity. At the very least, they're pursuing single-mindedly a particular project with, with no thought of the, the consequences for the rest of humanity. They're, they are manufacturing weird crabbed tomato plants in their labs just because that's what they like doing. What an odd idea. Whose fault is it? Who unleashed this meme of the mad scientist on the world? Oh, Mary Shelley. <laughs> so, <laughs> In, Mary, uh, in 1816, Mary Shelley goes to Geneva with her lover, Percy Shelley, and her half-sister, Claire Claremont. She's having an affair with Byron at the time. It's all very 19th century made in Chelsea. And uh, they come up with ghost stories, or as Byron says, think of, a, think of a story to chill the blood. And Mary Shelley has a dream about a man creating a creature which he brings to life. And this is the kernel, of course, of her book, about Frankenstein. And as you all know, Frankenstein is not the monster. Frankenstein is the man who creates the monster. So is it her fault? Did she do this? Did she unleash this meme of the mad, bad scientist onto society? And just how damaging is it? I don't think she did. I don't think she did. Her book is about much more than that. It's very nuanced, actually. She wrote it when she was just 18. And it's a beautiful book. It contains layers upon layers of story. And Victor Frankenstein isn't the evil man that we think he is now. She was really interested in the myth of Prometheus. The subtitle of the book is The Modern Prometheus. And in Greek legend, Prometheus is this titan who takes it upon himself to create new life. He makes a man out of clay and he brings him to life. And in this image, you can see something else happening as well, and that's the goddess Athene imbuing this new creature, perhaps with consciousness or knowledge. Prometheus does more than bring his creature to life. He gives him fire. Now, this might be literal fire. Fire is very useful. We know our ancestors have been using fire for at least 1.6 million years. I need to get a little bit of human evolution into this. Uh, cooking was incredibly important in human evolution, probably more important than meat eating. Anyway, right, that's a digression. Fire was an immense gift to humanity. They could ward off predators, they could start cooking, they could keep themselves warm. But is there a metaphor here as well? Is this a metaphor for the knowledge that Prometheus gives to his children? And various versions of the legend bring that out that in fact Prometheus is giving humanity science, that he gives them 
mathematics, medicine, metallurgy, architecture, astronomy, and navigation. These gods-like gifts that will ensure their survival as a species on the Earth. Zeus is really unhappy about this. Zeus is the king of the gods. What is Prometheus doing creating these creatures down on the ground and then giving them these godlike gifts? Zeus is so unhappy that he sends a flood to wipe out humanity. Prometheus goes to his sons and daughters and says, quick, build a big ship, get in the ship, you'll be okay. And of course, this is an interesting meme that reappears later on in mythology as well. So Zeus is then really, really upset with Prometheus. He has gone far too far. He's encroaching on the territory of the gods. So Zeus chains Prometheus up to a mountain in the Caucasus. Um, if that wasn't enough, he then sends an eagle to eat out his liver every day. And over the course of the day, the liver grows back. I don't think the ancient Greeks actually knew about the regenerative capacity of the liver. Uh, but over the course of the day, his liver grows back and then the eagle comes back the next morning. So this is his fate for the rest of eternity. So the days, the months, the weeks, the years, the centuries, the millennia roll by, and then eventually Hercules turns up, or Heracles, if we're talking about the Greek myths. And you can see the eagle just about to come in for his breakfast there, and you can see Heracles with his lion-headed skin over his head behind Prometheus, and he's just about to untie him and free him from his torment. So this was the myth that inspired Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein, this idea of creation. The creature in her book isn't created from clay, the creature is created from bits of dead body, and she goes into quite a lot of detail about this, the, that Victor Frankenstein visits ossuaries and cemeteries and gets bits of dead bodies together and somehow stitches it all together and ends up with this gargantuan man. And then he animates him, and although we think we know how he does that from the films, she never tells us. So one of the, one of the moments of genius, I think, in Frankenstein is, is, and the reason it endures as science fiction, is that she never tells us how he animates the body. But I think that Frankenstein is, is talking to us much more about the way that we carry out science, or in fact any human endeavour. It's not about an evil man. Victor is not evil. He is misguided. He single-mindedly follows his project. He doesn't talk to anyone about it. And he does not think about the consequences. The whole horror and terror of Frankenstein is unleashed when Victor runs away from what he's made. We get the evil Frankenstein in the Hammer Horror films. So Peter Cushing plays Frankenstein in six out of the seven Hammer Horror films. And this is the moment that the the evil mad scientist gets unleashed upon society. He wasn't there in Mary Shelley's book. And instead, I think Mary Shelley's book is, is talking to us about the danger of pursuing a project in a single-minded way, with no dialogue at all, and, and sealing it away from the rest of society. And unfortunately, I think that we still do that a bit with science. And we need to make sure that science is somehow in our society and in our culture in a way that it just isn't at the moment. This is Biosphere 2 in Arizona, so this really is a sealed, a hermetically sealed environment. We, are, we live in Biosphere 1. So this is Biosphere 2. This might be a, um, a precursor of something that goes on on Mars in, I don't know, maybe 20 years' time. Is that too early? But we need to get away from this, don't we? We need to get away from this idea that science is in a ghetto and that it's somehow separate from the rest of society and that scientists are, um, are, are ghettoized as well. This theme has been elucidated many times in the past, this sort of weird separation between science and the rest of society. And of course, C.P. Snow talked about this in his 1959 Reed Lecture in Cambridge. So he talked about the two cultures and the scientific revolution. And for him, the two cultures in Western society were literary intellectuals on the one hand, scientists on the other, with this yawning chasm of mutual misunderstanding between them. And C.P. Snow was concerned about this, not because he was worried about the danger of science, that he was worried that science was going to run amok, but that he was worried that the potential for science to transform lives for the better, to be a really positive influence on humanity, would not be fully realised unless the importance of science and scientists was understood 
and there was trust. So that's, that's where his philosophy came from. He wanted to unleash the power of science to create positive change. And he wasn't the first person to identify this problem in our society. T.H. Huxley, after whom this summit is named, wrote about science and education, and he identified a very similar problem back in the 19th century. People have critiqued C.P. Snow and Huxley and said, this, this really doesn't exist. We don't need to be worried about this separation. But I think that there are plenty of us who perceive that there is a gulf still, and we do need to do something about that. And I think some of the fault lies with our education system, where we have such narrow choices by the time our young people are 18 that they have basically made up their minds about whether they're going to be a scientist or an artist. And it's almost like they're not allowed to be interested in science if they've chosen non-science A-levels. We should instead, I think, be going for something like this, something cosmological, science for everyone. I sincerely believe this. I sincerely believe that uh, even if you're not going to pursue a career as a scientist, that science should be accessible to you. It shouldn't be carried out behind closed doors. Scientists should be communicating uh, with the public, and it's something we should be able to learn more about throughout our lives. It's so multifaceted as well, is this idea that you know, within that ghetto, all scientists understand each other. We don't. We don't at all. The one thing that makes me nervous about this image is it's a little bit awesome. And I think that scientists can fall into this trap very easily of overemphasizing what they're doing, of exaggerating the results. Some of it is probably the fault of the politicians. We have to argue for funding. We have to demonstrate the impact of our research, even if actually we're probably not going to know that until 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the line, and there'll be unexpected impacts. But scientists, too, do this thing. You know, Look at this science. It's amazing. By making science just that, by making it awesome and epic and amazing, does it make it somehow untouchable? Does it put it so far away from the grasp of everyone uh, that it's again, creating a kind of ghetto for it. In 2000, when the results of the Human Genome Project were announced, Bill Clinton says, today we are learning the language in which God created life. But this is annoying. It's annoying because he doesn't mention evolution, obviously. I'm an evolutionary biologist. But it's also annoying because it's, it's, it's exaggerating. It is hype. And I think this is dangerous. I think this sort of hype, whether it comes from politicians or scientists, is potentially as dangerous as a pervasive meme of a mad scientist. We have got to be more humble and we've got to be more honest in our dialogue. We think we have the possibility to transform lives to the better. I don't know any scientist who thinks, that, who thinks anything else about their science. That's why they're doing it. They're not hell-bent on humanity's destruction. I can assure you. If we believe that we are doing this thing to transform lives and the planet for the better, then at the moment, if we're not able to do that, if we're not able to realize that, then we are bound like Prometheus, and it's going to require a Herculean effort to release us from those chains. So we need to tackle misconceptions. We need to tackle problems with perception. We need to tackle those crazy stereotypes but we also need to be wary of hype and we need to carry out the dialogue with honesty and humility. And I think if we can do that, then we will recognize, we will realize the power of science to transform our society. And that all depends on trust. Thank you.